Topic, why the millennium? And uh, we spend a lot of time here trying to cipher out the truth, trying to figure out the chart of the ages and, and how all those things on there apply to us. And sometimes it's good to narrow in on one specific area. We, we have to spend a lot of time talking about just good Christian behavior. We, we can't let that drop. We can't let any of these things fall by the wayside. We have to continue to keep all the plates spinning on the sticks. And uh, so looking at the things pertaining to the kingdom is, is a vital part of our, our, our learning process. Why the millennium? I'm going to start in Revelation 20, verse 1 through 3. Why? It's the only place we have a direct statement that there will be a thousand year period. We don't have it found in any other text. I know 2 Peter 3 can hit at that, right? But this is the only place that we have that tells us there's going to be a period of a thousand years. So we probably should look at it. We're not going to look at the whole thing yet. We're going to look at more of it later, but right now we're just going to focus on these first three verses. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. I'll pause here for a second. I've got two different colors on the screen. So I want you to be looking as we go through the, re the remainder of the text. Look for the red lettering and look for the blue lettering because the blue lettering will be in concert with the blue lettering on this screen and the red, the same. So he laid hold, and this would be that angel that's coming down from heaven. He laid hold on the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. What's this thing about the devil? And I want you to note here that there are three titles and a name given. Okay, three titles and a name. The dragon, that's one. Old serpent, or the serpent, that's two. The devil, that's three. There's your titles. And then he has a name, Satan. Now, there are lots of views out there when I say out there, I mean in the world of Christendom and in the world in general. There are lots of views about the devil or Satan and what it is or what it isn't. And there are those who take the idea of Satan very literally and think that there is a being, some being that is a, an accuser and a tempter. And both of those things are important to understand, that there is a role of an accuser and a role as a tempter. And the name Satan actually is connected to the accuser part. The devil is connected to the tempter, or all things evil or wicked. The dragon, the serpent, I would see that as more figurative. But there are those out there who think that Satan, the devil, the dragon, the serpent of old, are all just a figurative way of defining your sinful nature or your desire to sin. They would define it as the little voice you hear in your head saying, do this thing you know you shouldn't do. But what I want you to do today is think about, and this is just one aspect of what we're going to talk about, think about how that would work with what we're reading here. If we are to view Satan as, as simply a figurative application of this, ask yourself this, how could he be an accuser? Does the voice in your head accuse you to God? And what did Satan do? What was his role 
in the, in the book of Job. And this is why some people are forced to position to say that the book of Job is also just a parable. But if it's a parable, find any other parable that talks about people that come from real places, that were real descendants of real men, including Abraham, right? Descendants of Abraham. In a real, very real land, defining exactly the number of children they have, all the numbers of friends that they have. Just, just, I'm asking you to consider all these, and this is kind of a side note in what we're going to talk about. And we're going to deal with this a little bit further down in the sermon. But now let's look and see, see what it says about him. So first it says he's bound for a thousand years. And he, the angel, cast him, Satan, into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should receive the nations no more, excuse me, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. So if you're going to stay true with the idea that Satan here or the devil is a figurative thing, what would we see happening for a thousand years? A little voice in your head saying, do something wrong, being locked up, cast into a pit, but it's going to come back after a thousand years. Now, I'm not saying anything more than that. I'm just saying, consider that as we look through the text. That's one of the things we want to look for. But in this text, we see this idea of a thousand years. So we're still looking at these things to consider. What's the deal with Satan? Why a thousand years and not 200? And you could supply any number you want there. Why not 50 years or 1,500 years or 15,000 years? Why a thousand years? And why not straight to the eternal age? Why do we even need that thousand year period? Why doesn't God just come back and change everything and we're all immortal and there you go? These are the questions we have to ask ourselves in order to understand this, this thing we call the millennium, the thousand year period. So let's dive in. Genesis 15, 7 through 8. And I'm going to move fairly quickly because I have a lot of text to look at. And I'm going to read 7 through 8 and then 18 through 21. Then he said to him, and this is God speaking to Abraham, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord, how shall I know that I will inherit it? Now we jump down to 18. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your descendants, I have given this land. Oh. Now, Axel. I say this because we should remember that in Romans 4, in verse 13, it speaks of Abraham and to Come his on. seed, Come that here. they shall be heirs of the Come. world. Sit. Lay down. But here in Lay this text, down. God is making a Good promise boy. to Abraham and his descendants that they would inherit a very specific piece of real estate. When you buy or sell property, usually a title company gets involved. And the purpose is that they define as exact as they can what piece of property we're talking about. And lots of trouble can rise if a bank finds out that a legal description is wrong. I one time was selling a house and I looked at the legal description and I said, that's not right. And the person at the bank said, yes, it is. He says, no, it's not. And they said, yeah, it is. The title of the company said it's right. Well, I have had happened to have memorized it because it was a really simple legal description. The northeast quarter, the northeast quarter, section 27 of township, you know, right on down. I knew it, what it was. And they had it defined differently. One man that worked there at the bank, his ears perked up when he, heard, when he heard me say, no, it's not. And he came and looked at it and said, what's the problem? And I said, well, you're, you're loaning money on a piece of property that doesn't even have the house on it. 
And he said, I think we'll close another day. And they redid the paperwork. But the point is, it's really critical that you note these things, right? And what we see in this text is a very specific piece of ground being promised to a very specific group of people being taken away from another very specific list of people. And it goes on and says that. I gave it to your descendants. That's who I've given this land to. From the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, that land that was possessed at that time by the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, and on, right? Okay, I think you get the point. Very specific promise being made. Luke 20, verse 34 through 36. And Jesus answered and said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are counted worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, nor can they die anymore, for they are equal to the angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. Now, if you happen to have your Bible open, you can check me to see if I'm right. But look above this. And the question that was asked them was actually a law of Moses question. And the men that came to him knew that the law of Moses says, if there is a man that dies, and he has brothers, and the man that died was childless, then a brother had to take the wife as his wife, the widow as his wife, and raise up children in the name of the brother that died, so that the inheritance would pass on. And these men came to Jesus and said, well, there were seven brothers. And the first one died, and the second one took her, and he died, and on and on. He said, they all seven died, and none of them had any children. So they said, so who is going to be married to her in the resurrection? And they were trying to trap him. And if you look at this in Matthew's account or Mark's account, it says that he said, you err. You don't understand the Scripture's right. Luke doesn't say that in his text here, but the others do. But Jesus' answer here is, and it's an answer about taking a woman and having children by her. And he's saying, you don't get it. The people that are worthy of that age, they don't marry and they're not given in marriage. Why am I going here? We have to understand that there are mortals and immortals, people that can die and people that can't or won't ever die. And mortals have children. They were created male and female, it says in the beginning, to reproduce. Immortals don't need to reproduce. So we see two very distinct groups of people. So we have to take that knowledge with us into the prophecies about the thousand years. So we go to Ezekiel 37, and I don't have time today to read about the Valley of the Dry Bones and Israel's as a nation's resurrection and to come back into the land, nor do we have time to read about the two sticks about Ephraim and Judah and those sticks coming together and becoming one land. I, sometimes we have to assume that you know some of these things. If you don't, read earlier in a chapter on your own time. But what I wanted to see here was some attributes of the thousand year period. Verse 21, then say to them, thus says the Lord God, surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, wherever they have gone, and will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king over them all. They shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again. Okay, so we stop here for a moment and dissect this to this point. Remember the story of Jeroboam and Rehoboam? If you don't, go back and read it. Israel was split. 
they were all under one king, under David and under Solomon, and started with Rehoboam, but there was a rebellion. There was a civil war. It was a tax war, a war against taxation. They split into two parts, and they were in two parts until the day that Assyria hauled off the northern part of the kingdom, and that Babylon hauled off the southern part of the kingdom, and even when they had a fragment that came back into the land, it was still a divided nation. And it won't come back together until this thousand year period. Also note, there are other nations that the promise is, I'm gonna bring you out of these other pieces of ground into this piece of ground that I promised you, okay? Verse 23, they shall not defile themselves anymore with their idols, nor will their detestable, or with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions, but I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned, and will cleanse them. Then they shall be my people, and I will be their God. So there's a promise that there will be a time when the relationship between God and Israel will be mended. But it won't be until they are brought into the land, until the decision has been made by each and every one of them whether they want to accept the Messiah and worship God in the correct manner. Okay? Reading on in this text. David, my servant, shall be a king over them. Well, I hope we all understand that David is dead and buried. Okay? And this was written well after David was dead and buried. And they shall all have one shepherd. They shall all walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. Why do I pause? Why did I say my judgments and my statutes in red? We have to see that in this time that this is happening, there is still law. What does law indicate? Breach of law. You don't have laws if you don't have people capable of breaking them. Immortal people are judged and made immortal because they're not going to sin. They're perfected. When we have a situation where we still have judgments and statutes, it's because there are people capable of breaking those judgments and statutes. That's why you have to enforce these things. Then they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob my servant where, my fa where your fathers dwelt. And they shall dwell there their children and their children's children forever. My servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will establish them and multiply them. Multiply them? What does that tell us? about the people that he's talking to. In order for them to multiply, they have to marry and give in marriage. So we have mortals continuing on. This is not talking about immortals at this point. This is talking about the mortal nation of Israel and the promises made to Abraham pertaining to them being fulfilled in a future time. But we have at least three generations here. You see that in the text? We have the people that are given the land, their children, and their children's children. Okay? Now keep that in mind. We're going to read more about that in another text, but I just want you to note that here and keep that in your mind. So he's going to make a covenant with them, a covenant of peace. I don't have time to read all these texts, but I'll just give it to you to read on your own time. Read Zechariah chapters 3 through 6, 
and see what it says about the one called the branch, I believe that to be Jesus, and, and this is being told to Joshua the high priest and Zerubbabel the governor, and they're called the two anointed ones, and under the law of Moses there were two anointed positions, king and priest. And Jesus is going to come back as both king and priest. And in Zechariah 6, it says, there will be a covenant of peace between them both, that the one that's called the branch will sit on his throne and he will be a priest on that throne. And it's in that setting that it says there'll be a, a covenant of peace between them. Otherwise, the, the king and the priest will both be giving the same message. And we're going to read something more about that in a few minutes, Lord willing. Okay? But he says, I will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. So the sanctuary of God is going to be back. Do we see it there now? No. There's a lot of conflict in the land of Israel in the, on that Temple Mount nearly every day over that location of that sanctuary. But it says it's going to be there forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The nations, so we're still going to have nations split, right? The nations also will know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. Isaiah 65, 18 to 25. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing and her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. Nor shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die 100 years old, but the sinner being 100 years old shall be accursed. Now we have to see if we can't sort this out, what's being said. And this is an area where it's helpful if you read a bunch of different translations. What he's saying is, there's not going to be any more infant mortality that's going to go away. Babies are going to thrive and live. But he says there also won't be an old man who has not fulfilled his days. People are going to live too old, with a few exceptions. He says, for the child shall die 100 years old. Otherwise, in other words, a child or someone who dies at 100 years old would be considered a child. But he says, the sinner, being 100 years old, shall be accursed. Which implies, if you don't live a righteous life, oh, immortals live righteous. Or they're not made immortal. So who are we talking about? We're talking about mortals. Mortals that have the right to choose in the millennium whether they want to obey or not. But there is a caveat. They aren't going to live old. But what about the rest? How long are they going to live? We have a text that says that their life will be like the life of a tree. In order to die at 100 years old and be considered a child, what would an adult be? Now, if you have a generation and their children and their children's children, how long would it take for that to happen if people were living that long? You know now why I said, why a thousand years? Why not 200? You can't pull it off in a shorter distance. If we think back to before the flood, how long were the people living? 900 plus years? But they were having children, you know, some of them were having children well into their hundreds. 
would take a thousand years to get three generations to fulfill that, wouldn't it? There's one different colored letter, lettered word in this. And I told you at the beginning, remember the, the colors, because all the things pertaining to Satan were blue in that first text, and the ones about a thousand years were red. Why is this one blue? Satan is bound for a thousand years. So if it is a figurative statement that sin in the flesh or your temptation to sin is bound for a thousand years, how can there be sinners in the millennium? Just a thought. Isaiah 14, 2. Then people will take them and bring them, and this would be Israel, to their place. And the house of Israel will possess them for servants and maids in the, ha in the land of the Lord. They will take them captives whose captives they were and rule over their oppressors. I, I want you to listen to these and see where this is going, what it's saying about the position of Israel where they will be in relationship to the other nations. Okay? They will take captives those who took them captive. They will rule over their oppressors. They will make those people their servants and maids. Isaiah 60, 15 through 16. Whereas you have been forsaken and hated so that no one went through you, I will make you an eternal excellence a joy of many generations. You will drink the milk of the Gentiles and milk the breasts of kings. You shall know that I, Yahweh, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. So they're going to spoil the rest of the planet. They will have the authority and the power to take the good of the earth. Isaiah 60, 1 through 3. Arise, shine, and this is all speaking to Israel. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Micah 7, 16 through 17. The nations shall see and be ashamed of all their might. They shall put their hand over their mouth. Their ears shall be deaf. They shall lick the dust like a serpent. They shall crawl from their holes like snakes of the earth. They shall be afraid of Yahweh our God, and shall fear because of you. If you look at the history of Israel in the world, this has not been the case. It's been quite the opposite. You don't even have to look back that far. But believe me, if you do, if you look at the history of the last 2,000 years, where Israel has been in the eyes of the other nations, and what the other nations have done to them through the persecutions and the concentration camps and the pogroms and the different things that have happened. This is an opposite, what we're reading here. Luke 1, we're changing the subject a little bit. Luke 1, 30 through 33. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Well, I think we don't have trouble identifying right here, right? He will be great and we be called the son of the highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 26. Then comes the end. Wait, I thought we just read that there is no end. It's 
So how do we understand this? This is Paul speaking. He says, Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. And he would be Jesus, because the verse right before, I don't have it on screen, says, Those that are Christ at his coming, that's the words right before. So Christ is the subject. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. The process of putting all enemies under his feet takes a thousand plus years. We wouldn't know that if it didn't tell us that. But it tells us that. So what's the end? The end would be of the age. Remember, and I don't have this in your text, but in Matthew 24, at the beginning of the, of the Sermon on the Mount there, or the, all of that discourse, the questions are asked, three questions. When will these things be? What are the signs of your coming and of the end of the age? But the discourse doesn't end in the 24th chapter. It goes right in into the 25th chapter. And the end is when Jesus says, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, then all the nations are brought before them, and they're parted right and left, right? Sheep and goats. And he says to the sheep, you go into the kingdom. To the goats, he says, you go to the fire prepared for you for the devil, or for the devil and his angels. That's where you're going. That's the end. Why is it called the end? Well, if we have this chart, which is kind of a chopped down version of the chart, just looking at the end of it there, so you don't have to crane your neck over there. The end is the end of the second heaven and earth. That's the end. It's the end of the age. But the kingdom starts before that. The kingdom starts when Jesus comes. The second coming. That's the beginning of the kingdom. And as I have in the red letters there, the kingdom begins at the second coming of Christ and continues without ceasing for eternity. We read in Daniel that that kingdom will not be left to others and it will never be destroyed. That it starts as a stone that grows into a great mountain and fills the whole earth Daniel 7 says it won't be left to other people. It continues on. Revelation 11:15 says, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. It doesn't stop, but it spans the end of the second heaven and earth and continues through the third heaven and earth. And that section that you see in the middle, the screen there that's in bright yellow letters with black lining, so you can see it. The latter days. That's important that we understand that when we read other Old Testament prophecies, which we're going to do right now. Micah 4. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days. That's why John, or that's why Paul said, then cometh the end when he delivers the kingdom up to the Father. It's not the beginning of the kingdom. It's the latter days of this age that we're talking about. That's the thousand years. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow to it. And there's figurative aspects of that statement and literal aspects. There's going to be some topographical changes in the land of Israel when Jesus comes back. His feet touch the Mount of Olives, and there's a great earthquake, and there's a split. And part of the mountain goes north, and part of the mountain goes south. And it explains why we read in Zechariah and in Ezekiel about the millennial temple, the temple that's built in a thousand years, that has water that flows east and west, well, for water to flow east and west, 
then the central point has to be taller than east and west. So there has to be a topographical change for that to happen. But also, I believe that the word mountain here can be applied to kingdoms. And the kingdom of Israel, the mountain that is Israel, will be established above, on top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills. They are going to be in a position elevated above the other nations. And the people will flow to it. Those other texts we saw that said, the, the goods of this earth going to that nation and them going to that people as the people of God. Many nations shall come and say, this is verse 2, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion the law shall go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Why do I have those in red? Well, to emphasize again the fact that there will be law and rule. But you have two anointed positions, priest and king. And what does it say in Psalm 2 about Jesus? Yet have I set my king on my holy hill of Zion. But what does it say about the temple? That it will be wherever I tell you I call my name from. And he said when David moved those things to Jerusalem, that he said, my name is called in Jerusalem. That's where it will be. And Psalms, David says, and it is that forever. The word of the Lord, the priests were responsible to deal that out. The king was responsible to deal with the law. So out of Zion, the place where the king is set, goes the law from Jerusalem, the word of the Lord. He shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And some might argue, well, what about when Satan's released and they all gather against the camp of the Lord? <laughs> it never happens. Read the text carefully. When they think about it, fire comes down from heaven and destroys them, and that is the beginning of the judgment. So the statement is true, that the thousand years sees an end to war on the planet. Matthew 19, verse 28. We're changing gears just a little bit here. So Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you, will have you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Isaiah 126, I will restore your judges as at the first, and your counselors as at the beginning. Afterward, you shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. And do you remember what we were reading earlier in, in Ezekiel? He says, when you have done this and you come back to the land, then you will be called my people and I will be your God. We see the same thing here. It doesn't happen immediately. It takes time for those people to be brought back into the land. And the only ones who get to come back into land, we didn't read this, but you can find it. The only ones that come back into the land are the ones that pass under the rod. Think of shepherd when they're sorting out the animals and they drop the bar in front of the breast, boom, and they stop and go, no, you go down that chute. The only ones that are going to come into the land are the ones that pass under the rod that say, yes, Jesus is the Son of God. No one else will enter. Luke 19, 17 through 19. And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little, have thou authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, Be thou also over five cities. I have these texts down here to show this idea that, that you're, the, the judges are going to come back, counselors are going to come back. But remember, in the stories of the judges, 
they weren't just judging like we would think, like a judge sits behind and with the gavel and says, you pay them so much. They were deliverers. What will the righteous, immortal people be doing as roles of judges? They'll be deliverers for those people who are still mortal, that live through the second coming of Christ, those people called the nations who still have the right to choose. Revelation 3, 21. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. As I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. 2, 26 through 27. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel, as I also have received from my Father. Revelation 5, 9 through 10. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Revelation 20, 4 through 6. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So why the thousand years? To fulfill the Abrahamic promises. The very points of the promises were Abraham, his descendants, including David and Jesus, and everyone, you and me, that are baptized into Christ, who have put on Christ, become Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That we have that time to reign. Why does it have to happen within your thousand years? Because after that time period, everybody's immortal and nobody's ruling them other than one, God. He's the all in all. So in order to fulfill those promises, we have to have that time period. Let's close with a song. This is very close at number 91, 1,000 years. It's in verses 1, 2, 3, and 5. 91. Stand with me.
kind and gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your words of hope and promise that you have given us to foretell those days that are coming, to give us a reason to be obedient to the words that you have given to your laws. We're thankful for their laws, those laws for their beautiful and their telling us how to please you. We ask that you will forgive us when we fail you, and we pray that you will be with all of your people, wherever they might be, to guide and protect and comfort and heal according to your will and your mercy until the day that you send Jesus back. May that day be soon, and may we be granted a place in your kingdom on that day. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.